The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book One On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness. Chapter Three Thwops in a Sack. Lily's one legged grandfather was on his knees, growling at something in the garden. Fat red potatoes hung from the vines, round heads of lettuce burst quietly from the ground in long rows. Sprouts of greenions, carrots, and sugarberries, her favorite, were yet bright and dewy. Like Lily, Poto got along fine with only one leg, though instead of using a crutch, he strapped on a wooden stump below the knee. He never talked about how he had lost his leg, but it was no secret that he had been a pirate in his wild youth, and he entertained his grandchildren nightly with tales of his adventures at sea. Like the time all eighteen of his crew fell ill from eating a batch of bad punk fin they had looted from the fishing boat near the Foob Islands. Poto was the only one who hadn't eaten any, and was left to sail the ship alone through a storm while his crew sloshed about moaning in the hull. And that's not the worst of it, Poto would say. I tell ye, that was with the Scrian Navy out on me stern, cannons firing and arrows whizzing through me hair. That's how come it parts in three places, see? Still can't catch a whiff of punk fin that I don't get the urge to turn and sail and run for cover. The Igby children would squeal with delight, and old Poto often got so worked up that he'd need to dab the sweat from his forehead with a handkerchief. He was wiping his brow with the handkerchief now as he squinted through the greenian sprouts. Grandpa, Lily said from behind him. Poto wiped his head round, waved a naughty wooden club at her. His long white hair was frazzled, and he looked like a mad old hag. Eh, watch yourself, lass. I'd like to have banged you on the head with me whopper. His white, bushy eyebrows shot up, and he held a gnarled finger to his lips. Thwops, he hissed. Suddenly, a small, hairy figure leapt out from beneath the potato plant and squealed. Poto bounded after it. Nugget, who had been whining happily, lost all restraint and pounced into the garden with a bark. The common thwop is a little bigger than a skunk, not much more than a ball of fur with skinny arms and legs standing as high as the middle of Poto's remaining chin. Footnote 1. Bip Thwimbly, The Chomping of the Skunk, Publisher and Date Unknown. The old man's club found its target and sent the little critter flying through the air, but not before another one darted out of the garden and bit Poto fiercely on his stump with his long yellow teeth. The first thwop crashed into the trunk of a nearby tree and dropped to the ground, where it immediately stood up and hurled a pebble at the old man. It struck Poto squarely in the forehead, and he staggered for a moment, shaking his head while he beat at the thwop whose teeth was stuck in his wooden leg. The thwop squealed and darted back into the garden. A moment later they reappeared, one with a totato in its furry paws, the other with an armful of carrots. They dodged another swipe from Poto's club and shot into the garden again. Poto roared and swung his club above his head. The last final rodents! A gust of wind moved the garden leaves and waves. Poto's white hair flew out behind him, and he leaned into the breeze with a fierce set of his jaw. A thwop appeared from behind a sugarberry plant and threw another rock. Poto swung his club and sent the stone zipping back into the garden as the thwops dove for cover. da -ha! A few moments passed as the thwops squeaked and twittered among themselves. Poto's face wrinkled even tighter. He lowered his club and cupped a hand over his ear as if he could have understood them. Suddenly, a fat red potato whizzed through the air and burst on Poto's face. Not the potatoes! Poto blinked the juice from his eyes and batted another potato away with his club. Not my potatoes! Just as Lily turned away, she saw him dive into the garden, head first, howling all the while. She smiled and limped back to the cottage, which was thick with the smell of breakfast. Naya tromped past her to the garden without a word, snatched two leaves from a rose pepper plant, and returned to the kitchen, ignoring Nugget's barking, Poto's howls of rage, and the thwops sailing through the air. Janner, who had finally managed to clean the manure from his face and hair, walked back to the house, dripping wet. Tink, skinny as a rake, sat at the table beside Lily. 
His eyes were fixed on the large pile of sausage sizzling on the stove, and the sound of his growling stomach filled the room. Well, that's better. Naya folded her arms and tried not to smile at Janner. I thought I'd see you with fresh grass growing on your face by now. Janner blushed and shook his head as he took his seat. Lily and Tink tried to hide their giggles as Naya pulled up a chair and sat with her elbows on the table and her chin in her hands, watching her children eat. Janner stared out the window, deep in his thoughts. Tink hunched over his plate like a buzzard, eating the hot cakes and sausage as if they might try to escape. Lily watched her brothers and fidgeted with the hem of her gown, humming and bobbing her head back and forth while she chewed. Eat well, my dears. It's going to be a busy day, Naya said, smiling. The children's eyes widened. The sea dragons, they cried in unison. Naya laughed and pushed herself up from the table. The summer dusk hath split in twain the gilded summer moon, and all who come shall hear again the dragon's golden tune, she sang. Footnote 2. From the Legend of the Sunken Mountains, a traditional Scrian rhyme. A later version of the tale was printed in Isaac Frencher's Comprehensive History of Sad, Sad Songs. See page 279 in appendices. Coming just like they have for a thousand years. Finish up your breakfast and we'll go on to town. The chores will wait. With a loud crash, the back door burst open and there stood Poto, drenched with sweat and out of breath. So what? He bellowed, holding out a sack with something squirming and screeching inside. Poto smacked it with his club, and the squealing promptly stopped. Nugget yipped and danced at his feet, nipping at the sack. There are two more of the little stinkers out there, but these three, he shook the sack, won't be munching on any more of my vegetables. I can tell you that, lousy thieving little thwops. He noticed his three grandchildren and his daughter watching him and cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Don't worry now. I'll be tossing them off the cliff straight into the dark sea after I eat a few of your fine hotcakes, honey. He nodded to Naya, trying to sound less gruff. Naya's mouth dropped open. How could you throw them into the sea? Poto scratched his head. Easy. See, I take this sock here and I dump it out over the cliff. Simple as that. Lily sat with her fork in her hand and a look of horror on her face. Grandpa, you can't just kill them. She pushed back from the table as the boys rolled their eyes. She hobbled on her crutch to her towering grandfather and looked up at him with a pitiful sweetness in her eyes. Poto loved his little granddaughter like nothing else in air we are, and she knew it. They're such sweet little things, Grandpa, and they never hurt anyone. Poto sputtered and pointed to the scratches on his arms. Lily didn't seem to notice. And all they take is a few of our vegetables each year to feed their baby thwoplings. I can't believe that you would do such a thing. Please, Grandpa, don't kill the little fuzzies. She grabbed his skirt, pulled his face to hers, and kissed him on a grizzled cheek. Come on, Nugget, she said, and she left the kitchen. The sack squealed, and Poto smacked it again, but with less vigor. With a grunt, Poto plopped the sack on the floor beside the table and shoveled a hot cake into his mouth. Now, Jenner lad, Poto said without looking up from his plate. It can get rowdy out there with the festivities going on. And you know the fangs keep getting meaner when it looks like we screens are having a grand time of it. Yes, sir. Janner looked down at his plate and clenched the sides of his chair, bracing himself for what he knew was coming. And you're the oldest, which bears a noble responsibility. It means... It means that I have to keep an eye on Tink and Lily and make sure they get home safely. I've heard the same thing every day of my life, and I'm not stupid. Janner surprised even himself. His cheeks reddened when he saw the look of shock on his mother's face. He knew he had gone too far, but it was too late to turn back. Years of frustration decided to explode over hotcakes that very morning. What it means is that I'm a nanny and I never get to do anything I want to do. Tink snorted and tried to hide his laughter by shoveling another large bite into his mouth. Janner kicked him under the table, which only made Tink snort again. I don't want to spend my life fretting over Tink and Lily, following two little kids around, fussing over them like an old woman and wasting my life. Son, Poto started. 
I'm not your son. You're not my father. And if my father were alive, he'd understand. Janner already hated himself for what he had said. He was breathing hard, staring at the stove, afraid to look at his grandfather's face. His chest felt hot and tears were coming. He put a hand in his pocket and squeezed the folded drawing of his father. Like never before, he wished he were on that boat, out on the dark sea of darkness, far away from Glipwood and from the way he felt right now. Hodo chewed and swallowed his hot cake slowly, considering his grandson in a heavy silence. Tink! Clear your plates and get go get dressed, Lottie, he said, without taking his eyes off of Janner. Naya stood by the stove, looking at the floor with her hands on her hips. The grizzled old man wiped his mouth with a napkin and gripped the sides of the table with his big hands. Janner was in trouble. He knew it. Chapter 4 A Stranger Named Esben The door swung shut behind Tink as Naya pulled up a chair between Poto and Janner. Lad, do you know I love ya? said Poto. Janner nodded, then added, Yes, sir. I know I'm not your father. He was a good man, a brave man. He fought well and died well in the Great War, and it's my duty to raise you children as near as I can to what your father would want. Janner stole a glance at his mother. She fought back tears as she stood and busied herself with clearing the plates from the table. Now, lad, you're getting longer leg and your voice is getting thicker. I expect you figure you're near in manhood, do ye? Poto looked at Janner with one white bushy eyebrow cocked up and the other eye squinting at him. Speak up, lad! Well, I'm twelve. I know that's not old, but... He broke off, unable to think of what to say. Sometimes ye feel like your brother and sister might weigh ye down like an anchor, is that it? Sometimes ye feel like this little town's too small for the notions in your head? Janner stared at his hands. With a deep breath, he pulled the picture from his pocket. Naya stopped her cleaning as Janner unfolded the picture and spread it flat on the table. He could hold his tears back no longer. They dripped from the end of his nose onto the picture, mingling with the spray of the sea. Naya hugged Janner's head to her chest and smoothed his hair with a for a long time. I wondered where that picture had gotten to. It's him? Naya nodded slowly. Yes. And he drew it? Yes. Naya dabbed the tears from the picture with her apron. That was a different time. A different world. She was quiet a long moment. Before the fangs. Your father would want nothing more than for you to sail your own seas, and one day you will. But if he were here, he would tell you the same thing your grandfather is telling you. There's a time to sail and a time to stay put. Lottie, I understand more than ye might know. Poto's voice was softer. But hear me! I was there when your pa died. I didn't see it, but I was there all the same. Janner looked up sharply. You were there? What happened? I. Papa, no, Naya said. It's time he knew something of where he's from, lass. Poto pointed at the drying, then at Janner. Look at him! He's the spitting image! I don't see what that has to do with anything. Raising Esben's memory from the dead will do no good. No good. Naya's voice trembled. Janner hated seeing his mother so upset, but desperately wanted to hear more. His name was Esben? Janner hoped to keep Poto talking. Poto and Naya looked at him with sad eyes. Naya kissed Janner's hair. No more, please, she said to Poto and left the room. Janner was silent. Poto was silent. The thwops in the bag were silent. Finally, Poto cleared his throat. <clears> throat> well, you must trust me. I see your father in you. He was a great man. He fought for us. Died fighting for us. Your wee sister and brother are treasures, same as you. And we wouldn't have our treasures lost. The old man leaned forward and lowered his voice. Blood was shed that you three might breathe the good air of life. And if that means you have to miss out on a Zibsby game, then so be it. Part of being a man is putting others' needs before your own. Janner thought of Tink and Lily. The idea of always having to look out for them still galled him. 
but he did love them. He wanted to be a good, brave man like his father, whose name he had just heard for the first time. Yes, sir, I'll try, he said, not quite able to meet Poto's eyes. Janner folded up the picture and looked at Poto questioningly. Poto gave him permission with a nod, and Janner placed the picture back in his pocket with care. So, lad, since you're so old now, why don't you and your brother and sister head over to the festival without your mother and me for a while? We still have some chores to mind. You're in charge. But Mama said that Lily couldn't... He, Poto laughed. I'll see to your mother. Just keep your sister close. Your mother and I'll be along directly. Can you handle that? Yes, sir, Janner said, suddenly unsure that he could. Poto clapped his hand on the table. All right, then. Now, there is something I need you to do for me before you three head out to the festival. He handed the sack of flops to Janner and lowered his voice. Would you mind dumping these stinkers over the cliff for your dear Poto? Janner's eyes widened. What? Da, da, I'm fooling, Poto said with disappointment. Da couldn't do that after Lily's little performance. Poto reached into his pocket and handed Janner three grayish coins. He took another bite of hotcakes, swallowed and burped. Buy yourself some munches.